Showing on this episode of Law Weekly, a chat with a life bencher and pioneer chairman of the Nigerian Bar Association's section on business law, Mr. George Etomi. We speak about some of the tasks ahead of the new president of the NBA, the proposed amendment of the Legal Practitioners Act, the conflict between the bar and the body of benchers, the role of the judiciary in the electoral process, and much more. Also showing on the program, Imo State Judiciary gets a boost as Governor Hope Uzodima swears in a substantive chief judge and other justices of the court, plus a recap of some of the top trending legal stories. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Shola Shieli. My guest, Mr. George Etomi, recently celebrated 45 years at the bar. He's a foremost commercial lawyer who has been described by many as the doyen of business law practice in the country. In this interview, I began with his views on the proposed amendments of the Legal Practitioners Act, the conflict it has generated between the body of benchers and the Nigerian Bar Association, and how to deal with the issue going forward. Essentially, it's um, a struggle for who controls the legal profession. Um, each of them has a part to play with regard to control and discipline in the profession. The BOB has its responsibilities, the NBA has its responsibility. Um, and if you recall, the LPA has been on for donkey years and has not been reviewed. So it was felt that as a, this, the time has come for us to have one composite and comprehensive law to govern the profession. And it is what goes into that law with regard to discipline and management that's the point of contention. The BOB will like to appropriate the powers to essentially discipline and manage the entire legal profession. And the NBA is saying um, that would be an overreach. And, and the simple reasons they give is that the BOB has composed, I think it has a membership of close to 240, out of which only 30, NBA has only 30 representation, representatives on the, whatever it's um, all the appeal courts, the, all the, 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 the attorneys general of the states, federal, federal attorney general are members, chief judges, various courts. So it's, it's, it's a large body, admittedly very busy, very busy. That is the problem. The composition does not lend itself. And the attendance for a body of 240, you'll be lucky if you get 50, 60 people generally in attendance. And they don't really have a structure to manage um, a body like the NBA. Essentially, NBA is self-regulating. And even though there has been problems with that, the answer is not to sort of tilt to the other extreme. And some people feel that part of this is rooted in the, what's going on right now in the NBA. If you notice, there's been a trend in the NBA preference for younger, vibrant leaders, uh, culminating, I mean, in fact, in the election of a non-senior advocate for the first time in a long, long, long time. So I guess some of the older members feel um, they were losing grip, if you can call that, of the profession, perhaps, and they were trying to, they're trying, as it were, to walk through the uh, PUB to wrestle that power. Um, my view is that um, the BOB, uh, as I told you, comprises, in fact, there are two um, sitting governors in the BOB. That is the body, and it's funded, by the way, by the federal government. So their subvention comes from the federal government. And you know, the NBA is traditionally a body that's a watchdog for the excesses of exec executive. So if that power is removed and uh, taken to the BOB, how can a body that's funded by the federal government criticize or even begin to take out actions like that? That would be inviting politics into the very heart of the BOB, which should not be, because you, BOB has other very serious functions it should be doing. They call members to the bar, they're in charge of discipline, or the LPDC is it's, it's directly under them, uh, for you to now go and give them a function that would see them be regulating the legal, the, 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 the NBA itself. For example, in the bill, there's a clause that defines the NBA. 
as the Nigerian Bar Association or any other body recognized for the um, management and um, control of the of the NBA, something to the effect of that, that language. And the question you ask is, is somebody contemplating, recognizing, a yes, a rival body, what does that mean? And that's the thing before the, the National Assembly. So naturally, the NBA kicked against it. And the NBA's argument is that, yes, we're due for a new law, but the A.B. Mahmoud regime, as far back as 2017, set up a body under the Tony Dibe, senior advocate. They did a fantastic job, a thorough job, and produced um, a bill that, if you ask me, would have actually modernized legal practice in Nigeria. Because what we're doing is to must, we must benchmark the work we do with international standard for reasons I cannot fathom. They're ignoring those recommendations, and they're pushing forward a bill that essentially, in my opinion, will add very little value to where we are today. So um, if you say they are loggerheads, this is the main reason they are loggerheads. And I really think that discipline in the profession should perhaps be put in the hands of a, an independent body, similar to what you find in more advanced uh, jurisdictions legally. Because let's face it. Uh, there are too many questions about discipline in the profession. And it's not instilling confidence. We, we see a lot of abuses, and so much is not being done about it. Happily, the body of Benjamin set up uh, a committee under um, Mrs. Fungadekoy, a senior advocate, to look into uh, these different positions with a view to coming up with a harmonized version that should um, answer to international best practices. So since we've gone on to talk about what obtains globally, let's talk about um, liberalization of legal services. Yeah. I know that there's talk about um, the UK and Nigeria and trade and the UK willing to bring in more trade into Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And they've also said that um, legal services should be on the table. Right. I know that you were appointed chairman of the legal subgroup of the Economic Development Forum, EDF. So how do you propose that we manage this? What are you looking at so that Nigerians are not left holding the short stick at the end? Yeah, in fact, it's interesting to ask this question. If you recall in my days as chairman of a section on business, Law. I've always been talked about, talked about globalization of legal services. And the fact that we need to open up. Exactly. I told you that that day will come one day. And we're, it's here. It's here. It just comes down to one thing how prepared are we in Nigeria to face competition that will come once the legal space is opened up? This is the question. Um, like you correctly said, this is riding on the back of the trade negotiations going on now between the UK and Nigeria. Again, to put it in context, since the UK left under Brexit, the EU, they've been looking very aggressively at new markets and they've targeted Nigeria as a possible um, trading partner for, for, for various reasons. Uh, right now, trade levels between us and the UK is just a little above $3 billion a year, a pounds a year and they feel we can do significantly more. And uh, that's also an attractive proposition for us. We, to our economies in dire straits, they're looking at our Greek, they're looking at um, finance, banking and finance, they're looking at um, energy, they're looking at uh, fintech, so many different areas. And it's huge. The prospects are really very good. Uh, but the UK side insisted, plus put law in the mix. And that's how I became appointed co-chair with uh, Helen Grant MP for the legal subgroup. And uh, what we've done here is to um, assemble various stakeholders and we've been having meetings about what we should do. Yes, it is all well and good to have foreign law firms come into your territory. But if the manner in which they come and collect briefs is unfavorable to us, then it's a no-no. And we've made that position very clear. Currently, the practice is that Consumers of legal services, especially the government, go out and directly engage foreign law firms, which we are opposed to. Because ideally, um, 
you should brief a Nigerian law firm who can then add an international firm if they feel the need for it. Because you, for a second, look at it. When will there be an occasion where the UK government, through any of its um, arms of government, will brief a Nigerian law firm directly? They will always brief a UK firm who then briefs a Nigerian firm. So one of the things we are pushing as part of these negotiations, which is really something we should do on the side, is for the Nigerian government too to strengthen our arms in these negotiations by changing their, their legal consumption habits. Because that's the way they strengthen us. If you do that, it will lead to mergers, um, the common complaints of um, lack of depth, uh, back office support and everything can be dealt with because the income will be there. Even through the difficulties, um, look at how Nigerian law firms have managed to sort of, they're, they're, they're fighting for recognition. We have now have 50-man, 60-man, 100-man law firms operating at high international levels. We could do a lot better. You this is the practice of the future, but we need that support very strongly. Uh, currently, of course, you know, there are rumblings in the UK now. The Prime Minister is going. Uh, this was largely his initiative, so we don't know the impact it will have on the EDF. We'll just wait and see. But for us, it's a wake-up call that um, legal service, the face of legal services is changing. Um, we need, to, we need to be prepared for the reality. This is the message that I've um, sent out long, 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 long ago. Okay, let's, let's come back home and, and look at rumblings. You, know, you talk about rumblings in the UK. Yeah. Rumblings in our own judiciary. Absolutely. We all remember the letter that famously leaked the 14, mm. the 14 justices of the Supreme Court. And so I'm looking, about how, looking at how all of this is going to affect confidence in the judiciary, especially as we're going into an election year. Yeah, I'm glad you ask this question because I have always maintained that perhaps our judiciary do not know or understand the power they possess to straighten out the, the politicians in this country. They just don't know it. Um, it's not entirely their fault. Perhaps it's a conspiracy to keep them the, the way they are so they can manipulate them. But they do possess plenty of power to check the activities of these politicians. Because if you ask me, politics Politicians are the greatest beneficiaries of this our democracy, but they are also the greatest threat to it. And because of the, what we see in the polity, mindless campaigns, they bring everything that divides us to the fore. They don't play by the rules, they mess up and then they rush to the judiciary for cover. And they are willing to do anything to, to have their way. So what we must do with the judiciary is just to stand firm, strengthen them. That's why we must put into context the rumblings in the Supreme Court. That's the apex of the judiciary. And they've just sort of opened our eyes to um, the lack of direction at that highest level. It speaks volumes. Um, again, the body of benchers is sort of weighted into it, and they are set up a committee to see how it can be dealt with. And the message is do it very quickly. Because as you correctly said, said this is going into an election year. And I know the kind of disparaging remarks some politicians pass about the judiciary. We just need to sort of turn this thing around. Um, at the NBA, at the body of benchers, I think there's a determination. Another justice sector reform group, I think the one headed by um, Ajibade, uh, Zin Advocate of Nigeria. There is a firm determination on our part to do what we should do to strengthen the judiciary. The judges themselves must play the role. And this brings me to the administration. How can judges be complaining we don't have equipment, we don't have diesel, we don't have, it's not on. Those equipped to do those things should do it. Just like you have hospitals. Hospital management bodies are different from the doctors. If you are a judge or legal officer who wants to play in that line, please go ahead and play in that line. But judges should focus on the work at hand. And government in its own best interest must just free up the judiciary from the shackles of the executive. Let's round off with uh, talking about the Nigerian Bar Association. Because now you talked about focus. Let's mm. put our focus on 
um, the NBA, because the elections of the NBA will hold on um, Saturday, July 16th, and then we're going to have a new administration. Also, as we're going into an election year and all of that, what role, agenda setting for the NBA, the new president? For me, for me it's very... The work of the new president of the NBA is clear-cut, and thanks to Ulua Pata, who has been so vibrant and very focused on what the fights he's chosen to, to take on. And that's my advice for the new president. You can do everything, just pick up on some key issues. One of them is what we just talked about, the judiciary. Focus on the judiciary. So whatever the work the NBA is doing to strengthen and free up the judiciary from the shackles of the executive, the NBA president must do that. Secondly, the LPA we talked about. Like I said, their work is cut out. Um, any um, NBA president that does not see the need for a strengthened bar and wants to take the bar under any other body will be doing a great disservice to Nigerian lawyers. In other news, the Imo State Judiciary got a boost during the week as Governor Hope Uzodima swore in a substantive chief judge and other justices of the High Court. We have details in this next report. <laughs> It's a busy atmosphere at the executive chambers of the government's house in Oweri, the Imo state's capital, as members of the bar and bench in their numbers gather to witness the swearing-in ceremony of the chief judge of Imo state, Justice Teresa Eberi Chuku Chikeka, and the president of the customary court of appeal, Oweri, Justice Victor Okori, as well as eight other justices of the high courts and customary courts in Imo state. The acting chief judge of Imo state, Justice Teresa Eberi Chukuchikeka walks up to take her oath of office and oath of allegiance to be sworn in as a substantive chief judge of the state, having served in an acting capacity since October 2021. One after another, eight other justices of the High Court and Customary Court in Imo State are all sworn in by the governor. After the swearing in, the governor underscores the importance of the three arms of government working together for the interest of the state. He says this is the best time to build a judiciary that will stand the test of time and serve as a model for people to emulate. I want to congratulate the Chief Judge of Fimo State and the President of Cosmo Record of Field and the other judges that have just been sworn in. For me, it's a task, very huge task and call for service. A lot of things have been said in the past. Past inaugurations and oath taking has been characterized by long speeches. But pragmatism demands that we need a result-oriented system a system that will listen to the hearings and aspirations of Imolites, a judiciary that will stand the test of time, not playing lip service to it. I see this profession as the citadel of justice and a model that should lead for all of us to follow. Unfortunately, events of the past has not shown total commitment to duty. A lot of blames and lamentations has happened. But there must be a time when our system must work up and people must play according to rules. Why commending the Judicial Service Commission for a job well done? I want to call on all those who are beneficiaries of today's event not to betray the confidence that has been reposed on them. The new chief judge of Imo State, Justice Teresa Eberi Chukuchikeka, promises that the body of benches and the judiciary as a whole in Imo State will not disappoint the people. On behalf of myself, the Honorable the President of the Customary Court of Appeal, the newly sworn in judges, we want to say that we are happy we thank you, and we ask that God bless you immensely. We promise to abide by the oath of conduct 
which we have just taken. We know there are challenges. By his grace, we will not fail. We will lead, I with my learned brothers, will lead the Imo State judiciary to another level. It's no doubt a new era in the judiciary system in Imo State, as these new appointments will no doubt enhance effective and efficient justice delivery. And just before we go, a recap of some of the top trending legal stories in the news. We begin with the report that the National Industrial Court in Abuja has ordered the immediate upward review of salaries of judges and justices of the Supreme Court, describing the failure of the Revenue Mobilization, Allocation and Fiscal Commission to review the salaries of these senior judicial officers since 2008 as a national embarrassment. Justice Osatuanwe Obaseki Osage, who delivered the judgment, also ordered that going forward, the salaries of judges should be reviewed yearly or at most biannually. Mr. Sebastian Hon, a senior advocate of Nigeria, had dragged the Revenue Mobilization, Allocation and Fiscal Commission, along with the Attorney General of the Federation and the National Assembly to court to compel them to increase the salaries of judges in Nigeria. The court also ordered the federal government to commence a monthly payment of 10 million naira to the Chief Justice of Nigeria, 9 million naira to other justices of the Apex Court and the President of the Court of Appeal, and 8 million for other justices of the Appellate Court. The court also ordered that 8 million naira monthly salary be paid to Chief Judges of Federal and State High Courts. In another suit by the Socio-Economic Rights and Accountability Project Serap and 176 concerned Nigerians, the ECOWAS court has declared unlawful the suspension of Twitter by the government of President Mohamed Buhari and ordered the administration never to repeat it again. It will be recalled that following the deletion of President Mohamed Buhari's tweet, the Minister of Information and Culture, Lai Mohamed, announced the suspension of Twitter in Nigeria. The government also threatened to arrest and prosecute anyone using Twitter in the country, while the National Broadcasting Commission asked all broadcast stations to suspend the patronage of Twitter. But in its judgment, the Equus Court declared that the act of suspending the operation of Twitter is unlawful and inconsistent with the provisions of Article 9 of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights and Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, both of which Nigeria is a state party. According to the court, the Buhari administration in suspending the operations of Twitter violates the rights of Serap and 176 concerned Nigerians to the enjoyment of freedom of expression, access to information and the media, as well as the right to fair hearing. The court also ordered the Buhari administration to take necessary steps to align its policies and other measures to give effect to the rights and freedoms and to guarantee a non-repetition of the unlawful ban of Twitter. The court also ordered the Buhari administration to bear the costs of the proceedings and directed the deputy chief registrar to assess the costs accordingly. In Plateau, the high court sitting in Jos has adjourned the trial of a former governor of Plateau State, Senator Jonah David Jang, and a former cashier in the office of the Secretary of the State Government, Yusuf Pam, for judgment. Justice Christine Dabob adjourned for judgment after the adoption of final written addresses by both the prosecution and defense counsel. Jang and Pam are facing trial for alleged criminal breach of trust and misappropriation of Plateau State funds to the tune of 6.2 billion naira. Justice Dabob has informed all the councils that the High Court of Plateau State will be going on vacation and all the council consented that the judge could deliver judgment in the matter during vacation period. The judge thereafter adjourned the case for judgment to a date which will be communicated to the parties. In Lagos, the state's domestic violence and sexual offences court sitting in the Ikeja area has convicted and sentenced Hollywood actor Olariwaju James, popularly known as Babai Jasha, to five years imprisonment for sexually assaulting a 14-year-old minor. Justice Olua Tony Tairo, in a judgment that lasted two hours, also convicted Babai Jasha of four out of the six counts for which he was charged by the Lagos state government. The charge against him borders on allegations of indecent treatment of a child, sexual assault, attempted sexual assault by penetration, and sexual assault by penetration. In her sentence, the court said, quote, I hereby find the defendant guilty of count 2 to 5 and is discharged of counts 1 and 6. The defendant is hereby sentenced to 5 years imprisonment for count 2, 3 years for count 3, 5 years for count 4, and 3 years for count 5. The sentence add up to 16 years, but the court held that the sentence is to run concurrently starting from the day he was convicted. This means that Babai Jasha will only spend five years in prison. And we round up with the report that another Lagos High Court sitting in Osborne Ikui has delivered judgment in favor of 27 aggrieved Nigerian investors and claimants who were scammed by a Nigerian couple, Bamishi and Elizabeth Ajitomobi, who allegedly fled the country after duping them of 18.8 billion naira. Justice Tony Oyeko Abdullahi ordered the defendants to pay the sum of 18.8 billion naira with interest. 
At a previous proceeding, the court had earlier frozen funds and properties of the defendants worldwide, as well as all money standing to their credit. The defendants in the suit are Imagine Global Holdings Company Limited, Imagine Global Solutions Limited, and the Nigerian couple Bamishi and Elizabeth Ajitomobi. The two firms and the Ajitomobi couple have been associated with an 18.8 billion naira investment fraud by some agreed Nigerian investors who filed the suit before the court. And that's the program this week. Many thanks for watching. Don't forget that you can catch a repeat of this program or past episodes on our YouTube page. Feel free to also share with us your comments on any of the issues we discussed today. I'm Shola Shirley. Thank you for watching.